G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so very good to see you. I do hope you're well wherever you are in the world. Today we're going to talk about this exciting camera right here. This is the GFX 100S. Smaller? S? Superior? S? Not sure why it's an S. Camera companies often use S's, don't they, to describe things. This is basically a GFX 100, but it's smaller. Has pretty much the same specs. Maybe the EVF and the battery are the two main things that are different, but none of those affect the most important thing about this camera. And that is that it's 100 megapixels small, medium format. That's its tent pole specification. That is why people would have bought the GFX 100. But what's so exciting about this camera is it's smaller and it's starting to get down towards the size of a Sony Alpha, a Canon R or a Nikon Z. Today, I wanna to talk about the GFX 100S and how that impacts and ripples the rest of the camera industry. So the GFX 100S, this is a very exciting camera for someone like me, for someone with my use case, what I do with a camera and how I use a camera, this is absolutely right up my alley. And actually a few years ago, I bought a second hand Hasselblad 60 megapixel real normal size medium format camera for exactly the sort of thing this is good at, 16 bit files high resolution files. And now just a few years later, for less than what I paid for the Hasselblad, this camera is doing exactly what I want. And the reason I purchased the Hasselblad is the type of photography that I do, it's slow, it's not fast. You shoot a couple of files at best every second. You're never shooting continuous. There's kind of no such thing as continuous, I don't think, on my particular Hasselblad. Things are measured and precise. So it's not like the A1 where we're talking about 30 frames per second, 50 megapixels, so you've just got gigabytes of data in a second. You can't do that. With this camera and with my Hasselblad, they work at a much slower pace. I think this camera is about five frames per second. So you're just not gonna get anywhere near the data and it's a completely different experience. What's exciting about a camera like this is, is it's, it's, it's kind of like the, the other photographer's option besides getting, say, your A1, your R5. A camera like the GFX 100S, I suppose, is more for landscape, for portrait, for commercial, for weddings and so on. And these super high speed animals, which are also high megapixel animals, are more for sports and wildlife. So you get two, you get a distinct separation as to what your use case will be. Now for me, people have said, oh, you don't want to talk about high megapixels and high frame rates. No, I, I, I don't personally want the two of those things together, but I'm happy to talk about high megapixels and lower frame rates. That makes more sense to me. I don't need 100 megapixels at 20 FPS. Of course you may, and that's fine, and you're totally entitled to want what you want. Totally good, totally fine. You've got your 102 megapixel BSI CMOS sensor. You've got in-body stabilization. It's around the size of a Z7 II, a little bit bigger, or a D850 or an R5, as I said. Fuji's lens selection is not the biggest in the world, but it keeps growing. This camera is now fitting in a place, a really interesting place, where it's the same size as all of these cameras. It offers a completely different proposition to the Canon R5, which is about speed and accuracy and megapixels, as too is the Sony Alpha 1. It's exactly the same sort of thing. Speed, resolution, fast. It's all about fast and collecting things as quickly as possible. Whereas if you look at this camera, it is taking its time. It cannot do anything else than take its time at five frames per second. And thus, I think this is a spectacular move and it makes perfect sense to me where this camera fits in. 
Price point wise, it is actually cheaper than the Sony A1. The GFX100S is an exciting camera and for those that have perhaps the GFX100 or the other GFX cameras, the 50s, this could be a really interesting place to go and it's super well priced. It's priced to sell. Maybe you're a Hasselblad X1D owner and also this could be of interest. If you're a Sony, Canon or Nikon owner, what does a camera like this mean to you? Now, if you've got the budget for it, of course you can have what you have plus this. As this camera has now come out, it really does fuel this notion that Nikon could do something similar. The camera that we see here today in the GFX100S is exactly the sort of camera I would expect to see from Nikon with the Z mount. So here I have overlaid the new Fuji GFX100, not exactly not exactly to the pixel, it's, it's a slightly out here. I have a feeling they've changed this the thickness of this piece of metal. So the left is the GFX100, the right is basically a slightly augmented Z7. Here's the GFX100, so you can see that these things are roughly the same size. I actually think the sensor on this side is slightly larger, it doesn't go as far down. But I was just trying to line up the mount, which as I said here, I think they're different. But what I'm trying to show is here is the size. If we overlay the, this is the Nikon Z mount to scale. That is the GFX sized sensor, the GFX 100S sized sensor sitting inside the Nikon Z mount. Similar to how the 35mm sensor looks inside a Sony. So that's how it fits. And then we can just add this roughly to scale and see the cameras start to become similar sizes. Not much difference in it. So you could easily see Nikon making a slightly larger camera than the Z7 II or the Z6, Z5. And lo and behold, you have this sort of system. And really the lenses are the only mystery point. As I've said, people have already told me they've measured the image circles on some of the lenses and they believe they are large enough for this small medium format sensor. Interesting though, so you could have one mount that allows you to do APS-C, this is 35mm and this is the small medium format. Be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Now it wouldn't matter to me if the sensor had to be 5 or 10% smaller because it would still be giving you 90 or 95% of the same experience. It's my belief though, a sensor the same size can fit. So this is really interesting for Nikon users because here it is, this is basically the camera that I would be waiting for from Nikon. It would be the same sort of price, the same sort of size, the same sort of specs. And if I could use some, any or all of the current Z glass, or even if I had to buy new lenses that would also of course work on my Z7 and my Z7 II, don't have one of those yet, Z6, my Z6 II, well this is kind of the perfect, perfect world, a slightly larger lens that works across the Z50 all the way up to a Z7 II, a Z8 or a Z9. This to me is absolutely the dream outcome. You have this one mount to cover cropped sensor, 35mm sensor and small medium format. So I'd like to thank Fuji for showing us what a Z medium format could be, might be, will be, hopefully. I really do hope we see that camera. But here it is. That's pretty much it. That there is exactly what it could be. What's really interesting is that Canon and Nikon's mounts, their new mounts, their new mirrorless mounts are similar. Nikon's is the largest and the shortest, but there's not much between them. It's possible that Canon could do something similar. Possible. Whether they want to or not, I don't know. Whether Nikon are doing it or not, I have no idea, but I still think it's possible. But for Sony, they do not have the same luxury. They, of course, have been doing mirrorless with this mount in 35mm for eight years now, since 2013. No disrespect to Sony, they are creating absolutely astonishing cameras. The A1 is superb, but I don't believe the E-mount can support a small medium format. 
So what would it mean? What would it mean to Fuji? What would it mean to Sony if Nikon and or Canon came out with similar cameras using clearly these existing sensors that are freely available to Hasselblad and to Fuji and to whomever else. This is a really interesting time because Fuji is saying what I was saying in previous videos. Not everything is about frame rates. Not everything is about blistering fastest of whatever spec you can find. I love this divergence. You've literally got cameras roughly at the same price point in the A1 and the GFX 100S and they do completely different things and they both have a place. And I would like to think if all photographers suddenly lost their gear and had to buy new and these two cameras were the only cameras on the market, I reckon you'd have a 50-50 split between those that want speed in, and 50 megapixels and those that are happy with five frames a second and want 100 megapixels because of all the different use cases. Hmm, I might be wrong. I'd love you to let me know in the comments which way would you go? But I'd love to know the data. Also, your thoughts on the GFX 100S. I think it's a lot of camera for a reasonable price. If this camera had existed three or four years ago, I certainly would have bought into this system over the Hasselblad that I purchased back then for a whole lot of reasons. It's pretty exciting. For example, the focus system on a GFX 100S is far superior to the focus system that I have in my Hasselblad. That alone, capability of video, smaller, more robust, there's so many reasons. It's absolutely fantastic to see you. If this is your first time here, please subscribe, I'd love to see you again. Please share, please like, tap on the bell. The bell makes sure that you see a notification of every video, not just the ones that YouTube works out you may or may not want to see. There is almost 300 episodes you can watch right now by just looking down there. I'll see you soon. GFX 100S, is this the precursor to the Nikon Z small medium format? Could this literally be what it would look like? It's certainly what I imagined it would look like, just with a slightly smaller mount.